picture, you know, little 11, 12 year old me picking up this guitar with my hands not even being fully developed, like trying to learn how to like do. Yeah, they have a huge on a neck, right? On a classical. Ass, yeah. 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 Thick ass <laughs> nylon neck. Bring me the back road. Yeah, so this podcast is all about you and your journey in music, and we'll talk about your new record uh, as well. Heck yeah, man. Love it. Sweet. So first off, tell me about uh, being born and raised in North Georgia. So, uh, I mean, I absolutely love where I'm from. Obviously, I'm a diehard Georgia guy, diehard dogs fan. Um, And yeah, growing up in Swanee, Georgia, I mean, to me, was really kind of the perfect place to be raised. Um, Mm -hmm. Anything that I could have wanted as a young man was available and you know you learned a lot about the outdoors you know it's it, growing up in a small town um that eventually became a suburb of atlanta um was you know it, it was kind of cool because you got to experience it all i mean mm-hmm. there was about two thousand people in the town when i was young and by the time i graduated high school there was close to twenty thousand. and so oh, it really it blew up there huh yeah it really exploded right after the olympics in 96 oh um, sure it really kind of blew up and so you know our our high school went from being one of the smaller ones in the county and in, in, in the area to being one of the largest ones in the state. Um, wow. And, you know, so you did, you got, you got to experience a lot. Um, and I would say that a lot of that transitions into my artistry, and, you know, I was able to learn a lot about the world um, mm-hmm. before actually having to be in the world, you know, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different people. Um, but yet it still all the while had that small town vibe, small town mm-hmm. feel. Um, and actually I'm, talking to you now from florida i'm at a, some a family member's house down here and uh, oh very cool still in the east yeah, coast, then. still 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 over here in the east um well i'm in central time right now i'm down near pensacola navarre beach it's kind of like a little second home for me oh very um, cool but if it weren't for swanee georgia i would have never had this family it's one of the chosen kind you know oh so, there you go you know it's uh which is which is really really cool so um but yeah man being raised up in north georgia um was was truly a a, a blessing and um you know, I'm, I'm very grateful um, for my childhood and, and being raised there. And it taught me a lot about country music. I mean, look, uh, country music, in my opinion, there's so many greats that come from Georgia. Uh, one of my absolute favorites is Alan Jackson. I think a lot of my music um, kind of lends to that as well. Uh, just growing up on that 90s country sound, uh, fiddle mm-hmm. and steel. Um, and I try to translate, you know, just a lot of my roots into to my music. Amazing. How did you, uh, I did see that your dad got your first guitar? Is that true? Um, so or he had a guitar, had, he had a guitar in, um, the closet. It was an old, like classical guitar that literally sat in the closet, like my whole childhood. He only knows how to play one song on the guitar. He can play La Bamba. So uh, <laughs> that's on, a good on, one. on guitar. Yeah. Is it a nylon? Was it like an old nylon yeah. string? Oh, wow. Nylon string. So picture, picture, you know, little 11 12 year old me picking up this guitar with my hands not even being fully developed like trying to learn how to like do yeah, they have a huge a neck right on a ass, classical yeah, yeah. thick ass <laughs> nylon neck and uh but i mean he had bought it at a yard sale for like five bucks and uh that truly was kind of my first guitar until i you know had worked enough um you know when i was like 15 years old to go buy my own first guitar and, uh, you know, which that was a lot easier <laughs> at that point, uh, guitar playing wasn't uh, as much of a, a, a burden anymore because the neck is like half as big. So it, uh, it was cool. Sure. Well, when you got, what was the first guitar that you bought? The one that you worked for? I, I bought a Takamini G series from just the little local, um, just a little local music store. And, um, my very first job that I ever had, I actually worked in a, uh, a western where uh you know i mean if you're gonna be in country music naturally you're, <laughs> uh you, you feel like you need to be where the boots and the cowboy hats are of course. um and i uh yeah so i i worked there and um i raised, saved up enough money to go and buy my first guitar and uh learned on that and just thought it was the coolest thing ever did you start writing so. songs immediately or were you trying to uh, co- uh cover stuff so i actually started like trying to write when i was in middle school um i knew at 11 years old that country music was going to be my life i i well i can't even say country music i knew music was going to be my life because you know when middle school is kind of those transitionary years where you're uh trying to figure out exactly who you are and and Mm -hmm. obviously at that time was was kind of like a lot of pop influence um 
which it wasn't me at all, <laughs> at all, <laughs> not my, not my background at all. And, uh, yeah, I, um, went and, uh, yeah, started writing, just trying to piece together songs. I, I, sometimes I wish that I still had, or I could find some of those notebooks from when I was mm -hmm. a kid to see whatever BS I was trying to write and this like <laughs> rhyming take things. some of it maybe <laughs> yeah, you know, just to see just to to kind of uh, you know get my uh, being an own witness to what was going through my head as a sure. you know, 12 year old <laughs> um and then once I got the guitar um I think then at that point I started like really trying to learn other people's stuff you know because that's naturally mm -hmm. how you want to go these, these are the things I sing um, but yeah, I, I shortly thereafter started once I learned chord structures and, um, you know, how it all framework together, I started writing. Um, and I would say it took me until I was about 15 or 16 before I finally had a song that I was willing to play in the guitar, willing for other people to hear. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So it, writing has always been one of those things that was important to me, but it was terrifying. I mean, if you're a songwriter and you, this is just my own opinion. Um, I think that songwriting is one of those things that's absolutely terrifying once you get into it because you realize just how hard it is mm -hmm. and, and how it is a muscle. Like you have to work that thing out. It's like anybody else getting in the gym for the first time. It's right. like totally intimidating. Um, but, you know, as you get your flow, it gets a little, a little easier. Mm -hmm. But then when you start to get surrounded by other really, really good people who are songwriters, then it's an entirely different level of intimidation of like, holy crap, I want to be like that. And right. how do I get there? Mm -hmm. um, and one of my biggest blessings in my life um, was there's a, uh, another country artist named Corey Smith, mm -hmm. um, who has done so well doing what Corey does. And he was a teacher at my high school. And when oh, I graduated, really, that's where he yeah. started out as a teacher. Yeah. Huh? He was a history teacher. And dude, let me tell you, Corey, we all loved him so much. We would go, he would be played at like a Buffalo's cafe or something like that. And it would be full of all these high schoolers come to hear him. But we thought he walked on water. Like he was just the coolest dude. And so you can imagine all these, you know, waitresses and bartenders getting pissed off about these little 18 year old kids coming in to watch him play. <laughs> cause you know, cause we're just in there. Like I'll have a Coke, you know? Right. And, right uh, of course. But when I graduated high school, um, he asked me to come out on the road with him because he knew that country that I wanted music to be my life, country music in particular. That's what I loved. That's what I was good at. And he's like, man, he's like, you know, we're about to go on our first college tour. Um, you know, would you come and just drive, sell merch, you know, tune my guitar when I need you to, you know, that type of thing. And so I got firsthand experience of how the music business actually is learning with somebody who was actually learning themselves which that right. was kind of cool so, you know so here i am you know 18 years old dealing with the the promoter of a club learning how to you know do an end of the night you know and get paid and you know right. let him be the artist so really almost kind of at 18 years old learning a road manager type of world right like um, a, an apprenticeship so to speak 100 percent. you know yeah. i can't tell you the amount of times i drove through the night at gold ford explorer <laughs> and, you know, here I'm 18 years old and the, the best thing about it was I couldn't drink. So they could all do whatever they were doing. Yeah. They're was, like, we got I a was, DD yeah, <laughs> no was, matter what. Like, okay. um, and back in those days, Brantley Gilbert was opening those shows acoustic. And so, you know, sometimes we'd split it up and Brantley and I would be in my truck and Corey and his uh, guys, uh, his cousin, Jason was the road manager at the time. And he, uh, him and Jason Kenny was playing guitar. They take the gold ford explorer and we'd be in my truck and let me tell you that was some of the most formative years uh in my life and just like i said learning how the business actually works uh -huh. and i'm certainly not knocking anybody who goes and does the music business route in college i think that's very important um because i had to learn a lot of those things after the fact uh -huh. but there you can't put a price tag on experience and right exactly I, 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 I tell Corey this day uh if it weren't for you i would not no, I would not be the type of artist that I am. Um, and I think it's very important for the artist to be the president and the CEO of their brand mm -hmm. uh, and really take the time to figure out who the hell you're going to be. Because um, sure. once you once you get into something, you can't like that's you. But it's got to be real because fans will sniff that shit out so quick. Oh, sure. And sure. They will absolutely sniff it out. And if it's not authentic. Mm -hmm. And I learned all that just from watching him. And it's been a such an a incredible blessing to not only have him as a mentor, but also a friend. Um, did you know, did his, his career, career break when you were like in 
you know, end of your high school years or like, how did, yeah, so how did you go from get, a history teacher to you jumping on the road with him on tour? Well, because he was a great songwriter as it sure. was. And, you know, that was back in like, back, like I remember when Undertones, his first record came out, he, he would burn like CDs and give it to us. And like, it, that was back in the, you know what a light scribe is back when it would like, like etch into the CD. Basically, oh yeah. Could, yeah. Yeah. So you light scribe these CDs and we'd give it out and then we'd just go burn copies and give it to everybody we knew, and, you know, cause that like had like 21 on it. And, oh, wow, you know, yeah. and, and this is back in the day where a lot of us were living, like we go to Athens, we all had fake IDs. Like we knew, like we wanted to be a part of that culture. And uh -huh. so, you know, but he was speaking it for us. So yeah, he was totally breaking in the back part of my, my high school years. And so That's crazy. it was legit when I, um, probably December in the year after I graduated, it started doing like all the big college tours, like all the big, you know, and, and I say big, meaning like going to finally other places and playing wild right. wing cafes or frat houses or, you know, some of the, you know, actually like nicer bars and, and whatnot in mm -hmm. town, but the guy was selling hard tickets, like, mm -hmm. you know, literally 10, 20 bucks at the door it was printing money. And it was awesome. It was so cool to witness like an actual original artist doing their craft and not having to like go cut their teeth being a cover person first, you know? Right. Right. And so it, it, it was so cool. Yeah. It, so I, like I said, I am incredibly blessed that I had that opportunity, you know, on and, my way up. Yeah. And at that point where you, obviously you're writing songs, but did you have anything like what, what, how did no. you advance from like, you know, merch guy to, you know, playing, maybe opening up for him or, or taking so it to the it, next level? So I, I actually left the tour because I got a role in We Are Marshall, um, oh, the movie. The film? And, oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, I had to go to basically move to Huntington, West Virginia for three months. And um, it's, uh, you know, that was a, an amazing thing on its own right. Um, but that was kind of like the breakaway point for me to like actually I got taken away to a place where I knew nobody. We're in a college town. And so now I'm starting to be there writing and trying to figure this thing out, you know, and also you're doing something totally foreign than you had ever planned on doing. I had never planned on being in the music or the movie business at all. Uh, just kind of fell in my lap. And I just answered a open casting call, like uh, classifieds ad. And I really, got, I got cherry picked out of the, out of the line to go. And there was like six of us that I had to go up to, to Huntington um, and, and be a part of that whole, you know, really historic thing, historic time. Um, so yeah, that, that took me away. And then I came back, did some more shows. And then actually to Corey's credit, I remember vividly one time we'd done a show in Tifton, Georgia, and he had kind of cornered me and be like, all right, Andy, like, what are you going to do? He's like, you can either stay with me because things are about to get really, you know, pretty heavy. We're going to start touring where we're making good money. Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually be like the head of like the merch side. And that's what you're going to do. Uh, you can go back to school. Uh, or I, I had kicked around the idea of joining the fire department back home. Mm -hmm. And he's like, those are your three options. And he's like, what are you going to do? Uh, and I chose to go back to school. Uh, and so I went to Young Harris College up in North Georgia. Um, and, you know, spent a, uh, a year or two up there and then left to, you know, go and pursue music. And literally all the while, while I'm saying all this, I would play in my hometown. Like I played like we had this one Mexican restaurant called Antigua, um, where I swear every time I was home, I'd always play, uh, play acoustic, <laughs> our little wild wing cafe. Mm -hmm. um, my very first gig that I ever had was I was 14 years old and well, my very first paying gig was in the men's section of our new Bass Pro Shops that got built one town over. Oh, and wow. All I had were these like literally like 15 karaoke tracks on a CD. And for like three hours, I did the same songs just over and over and over again. And, <laughs> um, but what was funny is that spawned like this lady coming up to me being like, hey, would you come like play at my husband's, uh, do this at my husband's birthday party? And I was like, sure you know and it's like you go from making 50 bucks in a 50 dollar bass pro, pro shop gift card to all of a sudden you know 
being 14 years old and they're like paying you $500 to sing 15 songs and they think it's the coolest thing in the world. And I'm doing it to a karaoke track. Like this is oh like gosh. just cover stuff. And even like, wasn't even comfortable playing the guitar live yet. And uh, then, you know, built a band while uh, I was in high school and we would do shows. And then even like, while I would be on the road, anytime we weren't on the road uh, with Corey, I would, we would play. Um, and just, you know, I was learning how to cut my teeth that way as well. So all that built up to me going to college. And then that was kind of the defining point of, all right, now I got to look at myself in the mirror. What are you actually going to go do? Are you going to actually go pursue this? So I left school. I got a job with Apple, um, wow. back home and, you know, just doing retail stuff and, uh, was there for a couple of years and actually like worked on building Andy Velo as an artist and, um, you know, really trying to hone in on my writing, trying to get up to Nashville a little bit, you know, just to like, before I made the jump, try to get comfortable. And mm -hmm. I, uh, ended up landing through a friend an opening slot at the Brad Paisley concert in West Palm beach, uh, Florida. Wow. And that's huge. Through, yeah. Through my, uh, so, he worked for Jim Beam and mm -hmm. that was my in with Jim Beam at the time. And, uh, they had cruising amphitheater. They, they were the lead sponsor for that. And so, yeah, we just ended up going to do side stage up there. And then I came back and a month later I quit my job and jumped all in and, Whoa. you know, was just like, all right, you know what? It's now or never like, you know, I'm 20 at that point. I was like 22. I was like, it's time. Like, if you're going to do it, go do it. Oh and, gosh. uh, man, I've had a lot of awesome things just kind of followed my path that have led me, uh, to be able to do, you know, what I do. And, um, but that was where it started. Okay. And at that point I only had one original song that I was comfortable with people like actually like where I felt like, Hey, this song could actually like go to the radio. Like I was like, this is, this is good. Um, and so but then, you know, started writing more. And then next thing you know, there's three or four. And then you're like, holy crap, I can actually do an album now. And, uh -huh. you know, um, and so back in shortly thereafter, I started going to Nashville every other, um, at least every other week, if not every week. I'd go up on like a Monday night and uh -huh. be there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then come home. And my band in Georgia, we would go play shows Friday and Saturday. Um, and then, you know, through again, that beam relationship, it parlayed me into being able to play. It went from being a local type of partnership to uh -huh. a regional partnership to where now we're going to other States and doing wow. shows because the, the idea was, you, you know, you go to bars and you see how a lot of, you know, companies will have like promotional models that'll come out and go oh, yeah, giving yeah. out swag and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm like, well, if this place has a stage, why don't we give them the same experiential consumer impression of giving them a t-shirt by having a band up there that's you, literally you're bringing the show so mm -hmm. now we're getting paid the venue's getting a free concert and the brand is getting their their the same yeah, type of press if not bigger probably bigger um, yeah you sure. know because and and so now you start building a fan base in other in other states and next thing you know you have a full tour schedule you know playing all these clubs frat houses you know, whatever, because you're actually starting to build fans. And, uh, you know, so that led me to, um, you know, really start to hone in on Nashville and figure out what that was. And so I, I didn't officially move up there until um, beginning of 2012, but just started making friends, uh -huh. um, wanted to get my name around town a little bit. And, and then by the time I moved up, it was kind of like we're off to the races and, um, you know, writing, taking pitch meetings you know, meeting with publishers, labels, the whole, the whole bit. And uh, yeah. So, you know, it's kind of a roundabout way of, yeah. of kind of telling you my back, my backstory. You but, put a couple uh, EPs out. Is that after you got to Nashville? So the first one I did when I was still in Georgia. Okay. Um, and then the second one um, was after I had moved up there and okay. um, have, you know, some great people along the way that I, had written with and um the the first the second one was produced by troy johnson and jack williams two dear friends of mine songwriter friends um and then uh though there were some really good songs i feel like we wrote on that project like roll of a dirt road for example i think was kind of like the one that parlayed us into okay this is actually kind of getting real like uh -huh. now i started to get attention from 
you know, CAA and William Morris and like some of the booking folks, you know, and, and they started putting us out on the road. Um, and eventually I ended up signing with CAA for a couple of years. And That's huge. They're yeah, big. they were great. Yeah. Big yeah. Man. They were awesome. They, they did so, so well um, with, you know, managing me as a developmental act and putting us as opening slots for folks. And, mm -hmm. um, but also they were very strategic about like, Hey, this is why this makes sense. Yeah. You're only going to get paid 700, 750 bucks, but this is why this makes sense. Right. And, your, your you know, name and your brand, your name and your songs are getting out into front of lots of more people. Right. I mean, exactly. you're putting up for and, and, bigger artists. Right. And that's when about the time that Spotify and whatnot was really starting to get attention and which was something that it even took me a couple of years after that to understand what the hell Spotify even was. And because you were so focused on trying to get to the radio level, um, you were so focused on trying to get the satellite radio and all these things that seemed like they mattered then when when literally people we were going to go you know open for different artists and you would have you know a bunch of people from those shows go and Next thing you know, they're your fan because all your music's on Spotify. Right. And, right. you know, it was so that was a cool advent. And I, I really felt kind of lucky to be kind of in that first grouping of like young artists that were really starting to heat up on like Twitter and social uh -huh. media and stuff like that. And then to be able to utilize iTunes and Spotify and whatnot in order to actually advance your career. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so my, when I first moved to town, I had always been told, go find a good attorney. And um, <laughs> so I ended up finding a great attorney. His name was Rob Baker, who left law to go manage. And he, he, he left to go manage Brett Eldridge. And he eventually, he and I, you know, we kept in touch. And he's like, hey, man, I want to I wanna manage you. And so I spent a couple of great years with him. And, you know, before deciding, I wanted to kind of take things back over for myself. And, um, you know, it's all, everything you'll ever hear me say is always going to go back to one principle and it's have great people around you. Um, you always will be the president and the CEO of your brand. You are the end all the be all. You're the one who needs to be making the decisions. Um, mm -hmm. You need to know every facet of your business, but have great people around you who support you and who also get what you're going for. Um, and certainly early in my career, I, I definitely had that. That's amazing. And once you got, you know, you got these EPs out, you're getting some opening slots, like how much later how long do you put out your, your first record, the collection? So the collection was actually, I don't even know what the hell you call it, progressive record. What we did was, um, and a, a great songwriter friend of mine also pr helped me produce that record. Um, his name's Pete Stewart. And we ended up releasing one song a month for oh. an entire year. And so Smart. 12 songs. Yeah. And, and that was a great strategy um, just to stay fresh within, you know, it, 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 people have the attention span of a freaking hamster nowadays. Right. Like, of course. <laughs> and so if you're not giving them something new, like they'll, they'll forget. And so it was really, really good for us to just stay in the channels. And it also helped me learn kind of how the algorithms work or how mm -hmm. they were working then. Um, they drastically changed since then, but um, you know, that's what we did. So we built that up. And then at the end of their, that year, I knew that I was going to like move on, like into what I would, that, that was kind of like the end of that first chapter. So basically everything that we just talked about, that was my first chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, so I took all those EPs and all that collection record and just threw it into one Got and it. then relabeled re it on Spotify. Spotify that way. So that way, collection. Yeah, or Apple Music and all those as the collection. Here's here's phase one of Andy. Got it. And then that moved me into, you know, it's kind of I'm a big MCU guy. So I <laughs> that moved me into phase two. Got and, it. You know, and we're in uh, phase two now with this new record coming two. out. We're in phase two. And in 2018, I was introduced to uh, my current producer, Jimmy Ritchie. Um, okay. And I've been such a fan of Jimmy for a long, long time. Um Jimmy comes from, he's a, first of all, he's an incredible musician um, and he's a fiddle player, which That's I'm cool. a sucker for fiddle, period. Uh -huh. And the guy can play anything with strings and he's really good at it. Um, but, you know, he's just 90s country. And um, you know, a lot of the older 90s country records that I used to listen to as a kid, it's like, 
you know, shit, Jimmy was a part of that. Like, uh-huh. it's like, it's really kind of cool when you think back on it. And then he did the first two Jake Owen records that I loved. And it was just a natural fit. I mean, from mm-hmm. day one, we just, we clicked. He's the first guy that I've ever been in the studio with where he's already thinking what I'm thinking. And I don't like, there's no, there's no ego. There's no, like, if I say I don't like something, I don't have the need to defend it because right. usually we're on the same page. Right. You know, right, right. there's been a couple of times where he said to state his case and, and I'd had to state mine, but there's such a respect there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's so good at just helping me as I spit out my artist vision for what I see in a song, man, the guy grabs it. Like, I know I'm speaking Babylonian over here and like, he's like, yeah, I get that. I get that shit, you know? Sure. <laughs> so, um, and uh, it, so at, at that time too, I was also working with a, an incredible um, A&R um, person named Caroline Mobley um, who just really, really helped me learn. Okay. Here's, here's your idea of a good song. Let me show you some songs that I think are good. Mm-hmm. And then we would go take pitches. I'd be writing and really kind of help elevate my bar on what I think a, a, a good song is. And mm-hmm. um, so, and she introduced me to Jimmy and, you know, so if it weren't for Carol Ann, I don't think that phase two would be as amazing as it is right now. She mm-hmm. certainly really, really helped um, with that. And so over the last couple of years, it's really just been about diving in and figuring out again, having to have one of those mirror conversations again, Andy, who the hell are you? Mm-hmm. Where do you fit into the country music interstate? What lane are you in? Mm-hmm. Because I mean, you know, there's songs that we put out that they're good and people like them. Like, like wake up, boat, drink, repeat, for example, I wrote that with Pete and driver Williams. And it's just one of the more poppy ones that I have. And so I can't say that I would put something like that on my record now, um, but it, it lived then. But then, mm-hmm. I, you know, I got Once You Go Country that Bubba Sparks jumped on, you know, just to try it out. It's all about figuring out like who, where, where you are. And then it's like having that mirror conversation of, all right, you tried all these things. What are you listening to? Like actually take a listen, look at your Spotify and Apple music playlist. What the hell are you actually listening to? And that answer is 90s country. I've never left it. <laughs> it's always what I listen to. Uh-huh. And so it's like, well, if that's what you love, why aren't you focusing on doing that? Like, mm-hmm. man, it's not like I'm, I'm having to reach for it. Right. It's just like, let yourself naturally go there. Like just, just let it happen. And, um, yeah. And that's kind of where we've ended up. And Amazing. so the last couple of years has been about writing. It's been about taking song pitches and really honing our craft in the studio. And the band that we had on this record, absolutely incredible. Like we did it at Shannon Forrest studio, which I don't know if you know who Shannon is, but he's incredible. Uh-uh. He not only did he play drums on the project, but he also audio engineered while we were doing it at the same time. Wow. So I'm like, he's, he's also <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Yeah, man, he is just, he's also the drummer for Toto. <laughs> like, oh, really? You know, wow. Yeah, okay. like, the guy's insane. But then we had Rob McNally on guitar and Danny Rader and uh, Glenn Worf on bass, Charlie Judge on keys. Like, this, this was just an all-star just moment. And actually, when we went in to cut this last time, we were only supposed to cut four. Mm-hmm. We ended up cutting nine. Just Whoa. because this, the synergy was just so good in the studio. That's incredible. Like we were only going to like probably like look at cutting two, you know, do a do a morning and afternoon session. And the guys like we ended up getting through seven and we all just kind of looked and, and at each other. And Jimmy's like, I mean, do you guys want to stay? You guys like down to keep going? And they're like, yeah, this is this is fun. Like, let's keep going. And we ended up cutting two more and getting nine in one day. Um, Whoa, that's a, it was it was that's awesome. it was incredible it was awesome and uh i'm really really proud of this record i'm genuinely i feel like i um have a and r to good project and you know with the help of, of great people um so i think the fans are going to connect with it um they've already connected with the first couple singles off this record that we put out um and you know i haven't really announced it yet as to what this is going to be but this is actually part one of this record so oh. it's going to be essentially this will be a double album um and it will 
it it will have somewhere between 25 and 30 songs. Um, oh, wow. So we'll draw ahead and on the 23rd, we'll drop way out, you know, as the 13 songs. And then, oh. you know, a month and some change later, we'll drop another single and then we'll drop another single and then we'll drop maybe small EP. And then by the end of the year, slap the rest of them out. And, wow. You know, I, I'm, I kind of phased it properly. I feel where, a lot more of your commercial stuff is going to be on this first side. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's a single song that couldn't succeed on any major playlist or at the radio level Mm -hmm. out of these songs. Um, And then we'll have some of that on the back half, but it's going to be a lot more of the deeper stuff. A lot of the stuff that's a little bit harder to, to just throw out there. Right. The stuff that maybe it's taken a little bit of of balls to decide to let people hear, you know, (laughs) Sure. So, yeah. Exciting. Well, I can't wait to hear the rest of it. I mean, the songs you have so far out are are awesome. I love Drinking Friends, the most recent one. Thanks, and, man. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to hear yeah. the rest of the record. Yeah, uh, me and Adam Craig wrote that one. Um, and that was like the first, that was the first song, like I could say I officially did like via Zoom. Like, Oh, really? Was, yeah, during COVID, man, it was all so weird. Like we're all having to get used to this whole thing. And sure. like, you know, it's <laughs> like, I like, I'm a big fan of energy in the room. I want to write like with somebody. It's a lot, you know, it's a lot easier just to, to like be in the same place. Cause everybody, I don't know, you just feed off people's energy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've always been a huge fan of Adam and Adam's a great guy. And he and I just decided to, to write. And, and we ended up writing that song in about cumulatively about an hour and a half, two hours. And Whoa, that's fast. Just busted it out. And he's a 90s country guy too. And so it just like fell out the whole thing. <laughs> and uh he's so talented. And, and I literally I got the work tape done and I sent it to Jimmy. And Jimmy immediately texts me back. He goes, You know, you you know we were cutting this, right? He was like, We have to cut this. <laughs> and we were going in the studio in like two days. Wow. And uh so one of the songs that was supposed like it'll come out on the back half, we had to bump it to make room for drinking friends oh wow and so, okay and that was like part of the like we bumped one of the four out in order to make <laughs> room for this one but you know it's just it, i felt like production wise like it would be something that brooks and dunn would have cut back in the day and Amazing. um you know i love it and it, the fan base is really reacting to it mm-hmm. starting to gain a little traction on tiktok with it too which is kind of neat i mean you know I'll, I'll just show me your drinking friends i mean that's it and people <laughs> yeah. literally are going and just at bonfires and getting drunk or drinking at a bar or whatever and they're just like you know doing their thing and like i get to do the like duets with that it's pretty cool like that I like is it. cool yeah that is really yeah, cool well andy thank you so much man for doing this i appreciate it absolutely bro would hey anytime would love to, to yeah i'd love to have you have back a, uh, yeah I always have a, a round two of course i do have one more question for you do you have any yeah. advice for aspiring artists yeah be patient love it literally be patient one of my hardest things in life to learn is patient. I wanted it now. Um, I would get so frustrated and so just like, like tight about the fact that I wasn't on the radio now. Mm-hmm. And this was 10 years ago. And be patient and, and understand that instant success can go away very fast. And, and the likelihood of that happening um, is actually probably stronger than not. Like, you know, just be patient, figure out who you are and, and learn what it means to actually have a brand. Um, you know, who are you? What do you represent? And that brand goes from not only the songs you're putting out to the posts you're making on socials, to the merch you're going to put out to your live show. It all has to be in sync together. Um, when you figure that shit out, it all, the rest of it gets easier. Bring me the back road.